and welcome to Counterculture. I'm Peter Whittle. Now, on this program, obviously, we've talked a huge amount about the culture war which is currently raging behind virtually all of our news headlines, and indeed we will continue to do that. But is it just a Western thing? Or indeed is Central and Eastern Europe also experiencing a culture war? Similarly, here we are more and more worried about restrictions on free speech and the growing sense of being behind trammel lines of what we can and cannot say, and what we can express. Uh, what can Eastern and Central Europe tell us when it comes to free speech? Can it give us warnings about the way in which we are going? Now, with me to discuss these issues, I'm very pleased that we have guests, some of whom uh, were actually grew up uh, under communism. First of all, we're joined by Frank Ferradi, who's a friend of the show, he's been on many times. Uh, he's Emeritus Professor of Sociology at the University of Kent, and of course, an esteemed author and journalist. Also, we have Anishka Kolek, who is an artistic curator and co-founder of the Passion for Freedom Festival. James Bartholomew, the author and journalist, and also the man behind a campaign to have a Museum of Communist Terror established here in the UK, and Emma Webb from Civitas. Um, thank you very much for joining us. If I can start, please, with you, Frank. Um, I mentioned about the cultural, which you write hugely about. Um, is there anything comparable, and I, I know I'm taking it as a, as, as a br very broad stroke here, but is there anything comparable in Central and Eastern Europe going on? At the moment, uh, at the moment, I think the culture war is raging all over East Europe. I think in many respects, um, it's very powerful in, in uh, the four V countries of Slovakia, the Czech Republic, Poland, and Hungary. And uh, certainly, uh, I'm kind of impressed by the fact that in many respects, Hungary has become the bastion of the other side of the culture war. Because I think in Hungary, what you've got is a unique determination by the prime minister to basically argue that number one, we're not globalist, we believe in national sovereignty. Number two, we take the past very, very seriously. Number three, we take the legacy of European civilization, which includes everything from the Judeo-Christian tradition all the way to the Rome, to the Enlightenment, as part of our culture. And he has gone so far as to say that he's prepared to become a, a totally at and at conservative, somebody who is even prepared to reject what he calls uh, the American type of liberalism in order to safeguard the cultural legacy and heritage of Western civilization. So the way that he looks at it and the way that the government looks at it is that Hungary's role in many respects is to play an active role in the culture war in order to ensure that the Hungarian nation and Hungarian culture actually survive. The problem that Hungary faces is that having been invaded by an army of NGOs from the West and having been dominated and, and kind of influenced by this kind of Netflix, Hollywood kind of culture, which uh, demean everything to do with uh, sort of Hungary's tradition, he feels that instead of just merely reacting, occasionally you know, sort of acting as a kind of backlash, you've got to take the initiative. You've got to decide what kind of world you want to live in. And I think in that sense, he is, along with some uh, Polish colleagues, the, the only people in, this, in the European continent at the moment who are actively at the official governmental level uh, taking uh, a serious role in, in fighting back against what we in Britain experience as cancel culture. I, I'm fascinated to hear that, actually. It, I, you say council culture there, Frank. I just would get to ask you uh, more. Uh, what general form is the cultural war taking there? Is it, is it just very similar to what we're seeing here in America and in the, Anglis, you know, the Western Anglosphere? Well, I, I think that um, 
in East Europe, if you take, for example, Slovakia, Poland, uh, Hungary, you'll find that there's a very big division which uh, mirrors the distinction in Britain between the London metropolitan elite and the rest of the rest of the nation, between Northern England, let's say. Similarly in Hungary, Budapest uh, is much more likely to be uh, similar, not, not entirely, but in, in large measure to San Francisco or to London yeah. than the rest of Hungarian society. And that's that kind of tension exists in all these East European nations to a greater or lesser extent. I also wanted to add on that note that um, when it comes to the situation in Poland, um, there is also a, a huge number um, within the society that travels not just on holidays and just to visit the museums, but also people that actually work abroad. And they had to work abroad through the communist times. At that time, it was only communist bloc that we were allowed to go and work. But then obviously after the fall of the communism, the financial situation was so horrendous that they, all the youngsters had to work abroad and not only. And now some of these people are coming back and they're telling their families, how is it to live actually in the West? And I have to say that um, as, a, as a young person moving to Britain, to London in 2002, after completing my studies, I was very naive. I thought that people in the West, they appreciate freedom. They understand the price you pay if you lose it. And, and I could observe that it's not such an ideal picture. And obviously with years, as things progress and we're slowly losing freedoms here, I can give exact examples of how this process happens step by step here now and not just be born into communism and already have this situation upon me. And people go back to Poland, whether they come to work here and then they go back and talk to families and, and, and tell the stories, how does it look like? Or they might be moving back because they experience the situation here and they just have enough and they don't want the children to be subjected to this indoctrination at schools and to the council culture, to the fact that you cannot talk openly about things where for us we've been there, we've done that and we don't want to live like this. You're, you're nodding along there, Frank. Absolutely. I think that uh, a lot of Hungarians uh, uh, have decided to go back to uh, Hungary even though they have uh, higher living standards. Uh, here in England for the very simple reason that they don't want their kids to be indoctrinated in schools. And they, ha they have this kind of sensibility that their way of life is being looked down upon mm -hmm. and regarded as kind of uh, a second class one. And therefore, what you've got is something that I was quite surprised because I, I imagine that a lot of Hungarians here would get brainwashed into, you know, sort of woke, you know, sort of BBC culture. And although some, you know, react like that, the, the, you know, a large majority of them ha kind of resist that. They feel that there's something there that's not really them. And, and, and for that reason, many of them have become sympathetic to Brexit. Many of them have, you know, decided to kind of go home. And they kind of, there's a kind of tension here, which is on the one hand, they would, you know, ideally like to continue living here, but they realize, especially if they got children, that it's much better for them to, to live in Hungary where, they, they exist in a culture that is, it actually takes their way of life seriously. I don't think it's only, only the fact that um, there's the indoctrination and there is one and only truth, but I think there's also the discrepancy between the reality of life and the things that we are being told and uh, told to believe. Um, so obviously most of these people, they live in the neighborhoods that are not well off, they go to normal schools, they have to deal with normal problems. They, they are not part of establishment that can fence themselves off from everything that goes on the ground. And I think that this is another point that we recognize from the communist times, where if you were at the top of the power, you could have whatever you wanted. And if you were down below, you, you didn't have that, but also you had to shut up. James, um, I remember, you know, when we spoke before and you came on the channel actually to talk about the, mu the museum, um, you know, you, we, we were discussing the way in which young people actually know almost nothing actually about communism in our education system. I mean, I'm, you know, from what Anishka and, and Frank have been saying there about the indoctrination, um, it, it is the case, isn't it, that sort of Western children have no idea about really 
the crime, not just the crimes of communism, but even what it actually was. Yes, this is absolutely right. I mean, there are two levels here. The first one is that they are taught very little about communism. 70% of uh, young people, I think it was one of your own uh, studies, yeah. um, worked out that 70% uh, uh, of young people, that's 18 to 24 year olds, had never heard of Mao. That's right. Who arguably was the most important figure of the 20th century, certainly responsible for more uh, deaths than any other person through famine and uh, and and torture and death and uh, murder, um, but they've never even heard of him, which seems to me an extraordinary failure of our system. Yeah. But even when they do get taught about communism, they do tend to get a greywashed version. It's not saying that, you know, for example, Stalin wasn't a nasty man. They they, they say he was tough, or that that's admitted, and that people suffered and even died, but. Um, it is greywashed to the extent that one of the revision books that I came across asks, invited students to consider the pros and cons of the collectivization of farms. A, a process in which 3.9 million people died in Ukraine alone, and I think is, is comparable to saying, to asking about the pros and cons of the Holocaust. It is, it is appalling and shocking, uh, I think, the, the downplaying of just how bad the collectivization of farms was and just how bad um, the, the Cold War and less, even Cold War is a bit of a euphemism, the Soviet takeover of Eastern Europe, which is a more accurate way of describing it, and their uh, desire to create an empire of communism, that, that, that the effect on the people who endured that is barely mentioned. It is seen entirely from Stalin's strategic point of view. And when it goes well, it goes well for Stalin. That, that's how, that's the prism through which it is seen. And I think this is, you know, a badly oriented and reprehensible way of, uh, of viewing history to the extent that they're taught history at all. Yes. I mean, this, this is uh, obviously a, a big deal, people, young people not knowing actually anything uh, about communism, uh, but it it really brings up another thing, doesn't it? It, it? We can't therefore sort of learn, can we, from if you like the warning signs? We can't. Pe people here become very, very complacent, have they not, about their freedoms, and in a way that I'm sure Anishka or Frank simply are not. Being. Yeah, totally. I think people don't see the signs of the times, um, and the example already that was given of of Mao. People are completely ignorant of the history of China. They don't understand the Chinese Communist Party as it currently is because they don't understand the historical trajectory to get to that point. They don't understand how China became communist or what happened during the Cultural Revolution at all. And so when you see people on television talking about when they're in relation to statues or in relation to Black Lives Matter, and you see academics actually using the phrase cultural revolution, they know what they're talking about, but the rest of the people who are watching the news don't understand the implications of, of what is being spoken about, and they also don't understand the implications of the things that, that, they, that they see, and they very easily misunderstand those things, or they try to fit it into a framework that makes sense to them, because ironically, uh, when our education system is criticised for being too Eurocentric, in some ways it is too Eurocentric in the sense that we only ever criticise European countries and European history and um, and Russia has sort of fallen outside of that. There isn't really a very even-handed um, approach to yeah. looking at communism and the evils of communism as, as, as was already mentioned. Yes. Um, Frank, you mentioned at the very beginning Netflix. Um, you know, and this kind of Netflix version of life. I think we sort of all know what we're talking about, really. Um, that, I, I know you're using that as a maybe an emblematic way, but that is what sort of in, if you'd like, it, it, it's infecting Eastern Europe or, or, or uh, and Central Europe? Well, I think it's understandable that uh, American soft power is extremely influential throughout the world. And if you're a, a, a teenager in Hungary or Poland, you know, you listen to American rock music, you listen to MTV, you know, uh, people uh, watch uh, Hollywood films, they, the American celebrities, the American stars have this incredible cachet even now. 
And what people often forget is that when you when you listen to the words of these songs, or when you watch a Netflix uh, sort of uh, program, they kind of subliminally send out a very clear message. So, you know, in the average Netflix film, you know, it's almost unthinkable that a heterosexual man could be sensitive or could be a nice individual. It's almost unthinkable that uh, a white person could in some shape or form be morally superior to a black person. It's unthinkable uh, in all these things that, uh, you know, that, a, that a child could be anything other than the font of wisdom. So when you're looking at the characterization that's kind of promoted, it's always the adults who are thick and insensitive. It's always the children mm -hmm. who possess the wisdom. Mm -hmm. It's always certain minorities, oppressed people who have this incredible fluidity and flexibility. And what you've got is almost either unwittingly or consciously a continuous degradation of, of what I call Western cultural norms. Mm -hmm. And I think that what, what, what you find is that if you go to Budapest or if you go to Krakow or Warsaw and you go into the trendy cafes there, you, the young kids naturally have internalized all this stuff, mm. you know, and they, they, they kind of that genderist politics is quite influential in the universities. They think it's really, really cool, yeah. you know, to kind of experiment in the way they do in the Silicon Valley. It's natural. It's quite understandable. And I think that for a very, very long time, the political leaders in East Europe, the older generation didn't really comprehend this. They, they were completely unaware of the influence of this because they didn't really understand what happened in Britain or in, in, in the Western societies. And it's only now that some of them are catching up and realizing that if you basically outsource your entertainment and your culture and your kind of cultural way of life to Hollywood, then you are going to have a real problem on your hands. You're going to lose control over your, of your own society. And I think to that extent, they're experiencing it in an intense form what the French have been complaining about for a very, very long time, as, as kind of they become aware of French culture gradually becoming extremely anglicized. But the big difference is, is that French and English culture share, you know, the, the trendy culture share many of the same norms. Whereas in Hungary, there is still a very big fundamental chasm between their way of life and the Netflix way of life. Well, exactly. It's interesting because the, the Pew, Pew, Institute uh, did, you know, some extremely thorough research uh, and showed that uh, if you looked at Western Europe and then Eastern, for want of a better, Eastern and Central Europe, there was an absolute divide right down the middle in terms of attitudes to what we might call, well, social and moral matters, same-sex marriage, for example, uh, patriotism, even the component that religion played in your sense of your nationality. You know, um, you know, James. Why do you think that there is such a huge difference? Um, what What do you think also are the, the consequences of that will be? Maybe going into the future, with regards to, for example, the EU. Sorry, with the difference between what and what? Well, between essentially uh, the culture of Western Europe, uh, extremely liberal on these issues, as opposed to the socially very conservative. Uh, values of Eastern and Central Europe? Well, um, there's a number of things I could say about this. One is to try, I, I think you're on the right track. I think that what the New Culture Forum is doing is right and that there is a culture war going on. However, let us step back a moment and remember where we were, well, where, where I was. I'm older than any of you, I think, except for perhaps Frank, I don't know. Um, but remember where we were some in the 1950s, 60s, when the Communist Party in France and Italy was very, very strong, getting polling 20% plus. plus, um, and where, you know, even then the, the idea that communism and that kind of control was, was still thought of by many people as a good idea. And now we've had the resurgence of Corbyn and McDonnell is clearly somebody who has a lot of sympathy with, with communism. Uh, you know, throwing the, the Mao's red book across the um, across the House of Commons, um, but we're not in the stage where the popular, where people generally are willing to buy into it. They're they're not that interested, uh, and indeed, you might say one of the problems for for those who believe in this is the fact 
that contrary to Marx's predictions, the working class have not got poorer and poorer. The poor working class have diminished in number and we're now overwhelmingly a middle class society of people who have clean jobs, administration and so on and so forth, who have our holidays in, uh, around the world. Um, and it's, we're, they're fighting up against, if you look at it from the other point of view, their struggle is with the fact that many people are very happily having very bourgeois lives. They may be subliminally taking in Netflix messages, but they're actually living a totally bourgeois life. And it's, they really will have to lose all their sense of what their own interest is to give that up in any major way. Uh, I don't think we're just talking about the, the material side of life. I think it's more about actually what you are allowed to say when and how and whether you are allowed to actually think freely publicly in a public sphere. And this is where m my worry lies heavily that we've already lost it and the speech is heavily censored from the point of your workplace in Scotland now it's also talking about now policing your speech in at your dining table I know, yes. so the the boundaries are being pushed and pushed and pushed and what worries me the most and and I was thinking about it early on as we are as we've been talking is that there are certain patterns and certain things emerging so we've all been fooled with um, communism and socialism because the intentions were good now the people that are denying us freedom to think and speak freely they also say they have good intentions. They want to improve the society. They're doing it for our own good. So why do we oppose? What's wrong with us? We must be evil. <laughs> and what do you do with evil people? Maybe in the past you were sh sh sending them to the gulag or giving them the bullet at the back of the head straight away. Now what do you do? You make sure they have no place in the public sphere. They lose their job. They hunted down of the social media, of the area where they live, from their colleagues. That's how you do it. And then add to that the artificial intelligence and the possibility of controlling people, people's lives through that. And we don't have to look far. We look to China, the social credit system. What have you done? You cannot travel now. You cannot take the train. Oh, no, you shouldn't go to this university. And every move will be monitored. Why did we have the facial recognition system tried in this country with no permission from us a year ago? Was it a year ago? Mm -hmm. Why was it tried without our permission? And step by step, we're losing these freedoms. And step by step, we're being lulled into this false sense of security. It's because we care. I really care about all of you. Mm -hmm. And I want the good for you. James, do you want to come back on that point, that it's not actually just about the economics? Absolutely, yes. And I mean, that's, a, a, that's a, in a way, there are many different axes in which you can analyse a society. And the, the one that you just mentioned is absolutely fair. And I agree that it's, it's damaging and it's right that, that people like us should push back against it. And I think a pushback is taking place. Um, I mean, I, without wishing to predict the future, I think... The, 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 force of, the force of nature will be that the BBC, if it continues to be so woke, will continue to lose viewers. And BBC is much more pernicious, I think, than Netflix, uh, because it really is pushing a whole series of values and a whole series of guilt trips, which may appear subliminally and subtly in Netflix movies, but the Netflix movies are often watched without people realising what the underlying message is, is meant to be. So... I'm, I, I feel that, maybe I'm Panglossian about this, I, I feel that people, you are part of the pushback, and that's great, but the pushback will continue, and you, have, you, you are not alone, you have a whole lot of people who are apolitical, who instinctively agree with you. I think uh, that, that's very nice to hear, but um, I, I do think that the, the point really, I would say, is that there are many, most people actually uh, feel the way that Anishka feels, I, they feel very, very uh, disenfranchised uh, in what they can say. The point is this, is that they're not in influ influential positions, that's the point. The, it's all the influential positions from education right the way through where this is the case. Um, Frank, you know, 
obviously you're you know you're emeritus professor of sociology at Kent. You, you've lived an academic life. Um, the the general situation on our campuses, you know, whilst one is not going to try and maybe compare it to, you know, communist Hungary or whatever, but it it, it is so serious that it does make one feel, does it not, that there is a kind of form of creeping totalitarianism. I mean, some of woke people have actually been called cultural totalitarians, haven't they? I think we need to get the balance on this. It is very difficult. And I'm particularly worried about the power of self-censorship, yeah. which pervades the classrooms and the seminars. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, the day after the Brexit referendum, uh, I went into the senior common room, and everybody knows that I was one of the well, one of the only professors who supported Brexit. And I'm looking around, and I and, and everybody's crying like in a clinic. So I write it up. I did an article for the Times Higher on how people in universities hated Brexit and 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 uh, what a shame it was. Next day, and for the next few days, I get about 60, 70 emails from other academics saying, Frank. I totally agree with you. What you say is absolutely right, but I don't think that I could say it. You know, I'm not a professor like you, or I don't think I want to be ostracized. And essentially, they're saying that they're too scared to, you know, essentially echo the views that I put forward and which they believe in. And I sent them back the same email. I said, look, you're not living in Stalinist Russia. You're not living in Nazi Germany. Why don't you stand up and make sure your voice is heard. And I think that, you know, that kind of um, message of, of, of empowering people to find their voice is very important because I do think it's not too late on campuses. You know, as long as people have the, you know, a, a, even a small number of people are prepared to stand up. At the moment, the situation is really from bad to worse. I don't know if you saw a report that was published yesterday. Uh, I think it was a report about Canada and America which showed that only about 18 to 20 percent of the of academics that were interviewed indicated that they wouldn't even talk to somebody mm. who didn't share their political views. Mm -hmm. No, they wouldn't even have a conversation with them, never mind anything else. And when you have that kind of polarization on campus, that kind of attempt to shut discussion down, then then we have a problem. And I, I think what you say, Peter, about influence is important. You have to remember that almost 50% of young people now go to universities. Higher education is, is the most powerful institution in our society because the products of higher education then go and run businesses, they run the media, they run all the influential institutions of our society. So I do think we should bear this in mind when we talk about universities. Mm. Um, you know, you've, we've talked an awful lot about the you know, situation in universities. Uh, I heard it remarked actually yesterday that in fact the which backs obviously what Frank is saying up is that in fact conservatism and conservatives actually just don't even figure in the it's not like they they just don't even figure actually in the argument anymore in colleges. Yeah. There, there seem, seems to be uh, an assumption on the part of some academics that the consequence of being academic is that you become left-wing politically um, and that is all sort of tied in I, I think with the ass assigning uh, moral values to holding particular political or cultural opinions. Uh, the, th the thing that worries me most though and, and this is off the back of what Anishka was saying there as well is that we're sleepwalking into these things it's not necessarily you know, a, a particularly conscious thing. What worries me most is that within the universities, but also, you know, in the media with the BBC, there's a sort of increasing tacit acceptance that certain restrictions on our liberties are acceptable um, in a way that I think my parents' generation just would have instinctively rejected. And I worry that people my age and younger are more softened to having these sorts of things removed because as Anishka said that they're doing it in the name of 
you know, it's for your own good. And there's nothing more sinister than somebody telling you that you should have your freedoms taken away for your own good and for the benefit of society. And that is the thing that I think is most worrying. And that, going back to the beginning of this discussion, I think is where it would help for people to have a better understanding and education of communism. It's why George Orwell's books are not only so popular, but also so brilliantly accurate in the way that he satires these things, because he really understood the kind of sinister but slightly comical way that these things un unravel. And um, even when Orwell is taught in schools, he isn't taught well. He isn't taught in the context of the Cultural Revolution in China. It, 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 no, nobody mentions Solzhenitsyn um, within you know, the, the context of discussing Orwell at GCSE, for example. So I think that's one of the reasons why it would be useful for people to have a better education about communism. And, and also, particularly, you know, the history of post-Soviet countries so that maybe we could have a little bit of resilience against these sorts of things amongst the younger population because I think that instinct of rejection is still there amongst older people but I worry that increasingly less so amongst yeah. the younger people particularly because of the power of cultural influen culturally influential things like Netflix you know it might not be explicit the way that they state the values, but the fact that they're tied into the entire world view that is being put forward as this kind of cultural mythology, that's the thing that worries me, because that, that cultural mythology is not reality, um, but the exposure to it is so great for young people um, that it changes the sorts of things they're willing to accept from the government. On the, on the note of the, of the movies and culture, I just wanted to... Um make a point that it seems that the communist has been softened in the image when it comes to Hollywood and the movies. It hasn't been analyzed as in depth as the Second World War. So that was the first thing. And quite often you would see the movies were actually, it was more like a comedy. So like with this Berlin Wall that the mother doesn't know because she was in a coma and it's ha ha ha. Yes, uh, goodbye he, he, he. Then, and I've been to the cinema to watch this movie with my brother. And when we came out, he was heartbroken. And he said that he couldn't stand people laughing because he could see the family be being broken and our family was affected by communists too. And we also went through horrendous experiences because the family had to separate. So, um, so this is one point I wanted to make. And the other thing that I was thinking about is that um, within the education, um, it's n not looking at, uh, at in-depth analysis of the elements of, of what came together to, to make it happen and the results of it. And I think it would be, it would be worth to, to also dig deeper there. Um, you were going to say something, James? Yes, um, I was going to say, I think the key thing that has influenced Britain, both in terms of what you've been discussing and in terms of uh, sympathy for communism, uh, emerges from the, at the end of the Cold War. People of my generation, um, uh, whether you were on the left, like Attlee, or whether you were on, on, the, on the right, um, or like Thatcher, either way, you knew what you stood for, that, and it was not communism. So you, the fact that communism existed and seemed to be a threat united liberals and conservatives in an awareness of what they did value, of what was important to them. And gradually, the, we have, well, particularly, I, just, I would say liberals have lost sight of, of that thing that we have in common. And they now regard conservatives as the better enemy without having the counterpoint of seeing that communism was a much bigger enemy than conservatism. Yes. And so now, as it were, the energies of, to, to, to fight and combat and be virtuous and think of yourself as virtuous are going towards conservatism and the established order, you know, which on a, in what I would regard on a, on a fairly, not exactly minor, but the minor compared to gulags, compared to mass murder. Um, they are putting their energies into conservatism and hating conservatism in, and in, in various forms of behavior and it, men, whites, old people, uh, instead of realizing that actually we are part of a civilization that values liberalism in its general sense, freedom of speech, democracy. And these are things which liberals and conservatives have in common. And, we've lost, and people have lost sight of this important thing that those on the left and the right have in common. But I have a fear that 
that the left seems to be overtaken by ideology that is on the on the verge of being like a cult way of thinking. Well, he is a cult, where, I think. Yeah. Where they don't see the value in conservatives. They don't see the value in actually having this balancing act between the left and the right and what's in the middle and actually having the middle where people can be one leg here and one leg there. So, and, and the cult's approach is actually to erase anything that doesn't agree with the cult's beliefs and ways of behaving. And the other thing that I was also thinking is about looking at the social media and how quickly we moved into censoring people, removing people, and without actually looking into, okay, if you say there is fake news or if, if exactly other, other countries are maybe influencing the discussion there, let's educate the society, let's educate the children how to look at this and that. No, we're moving into censoring people, we're moving into removing people. So instead of trying to bring people up, we're actually pushing them down because we know better what is better for you and we care about you, so we're going to do what we want to do. Can I just ask, uh, I can ask uh, Frank uh, something, but before we leave that, you, you know, we mentioned a bit about young people going back, like to Poland or whatever, and uh, are they, I mean, it's anecdotal, but are they kind of appalled and fed up by the fact that you can't say anything here anymore? Is that the impression you get, or have they taken it on board? No, people are fed up and it's not natural. And, and also they, a lot of families move back because of terror attacks and people just have enough of this. Mm. Frank, you started out by saying, um, talking about Hungary and how it was sort of almost, well not quite just on its own, but it was sort of acting as an opposition to the creeping culture war. Uh, first of all, are you in favour, do you think that's a good thing and also, should we do what they're doing? Yeah, I think so. I think that at the moment there's a kind of embarrassment and, and reluctance to say we need, we too need to uh, sort of take up the uh, the war of culture because at the moment we're at the receiving end all the time, and you know our way of life is being diminished and pathologized, and what we have in response is a very half-hearted you know, sort of kind of series of backlash. Uh, and at the moment we're losing every single battle. If I look back the last 20 years, on every single question, you know, we've lost ground and, uh, and, and we've been forced to become embarrassed and apologize for who we are. Whereas I think that what's really needed is a much more robust, proactive thing where instead of us reacting, you know, we take the initiative. So take, take what I think is, is, is a key question here in Britain, which is, you know, what do we think of Britain's past? You know, are we going to apologize for Britain, you know, not being always, you know, sort of uh, honorable, always doing the best thing? Or are we going to say that on balance, you know, there's something wonderful about what Britain has done over the, the centuries, and we're going to praise it, and we're going to make a virtue out of it, and we're going to really celebrate being British. Now, I say that as somebody who wasn't even born here, was not even English. Yeah, but this, really, but you prove our point in a way, Frank. You're proving our point. <laughs> I mean, unless you do that, then you're uh, going to be continually wrong-footed. And I think what 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 uh, Orban, the Prime Minister in Hungary, has done, and he he knows that he it's a very difficult job that is undertaken, is to actually say that the future of Hungary and for that matter of Europe, at the end of the day, is going to be decided on the terrain of culture. You know, the future is not simply reducible to economics. It's not simply reducible to material possessions and material goods. It's, uh, de it depends upon the meaning that we can endow human experience. What does it mean to be a human being? What does it mean to be a member of a family? And then, uh, you know, just uh, yesterday I was talking to one of his advisors and he made the point that uh, the one good thing about the pandemic that helps people like us is, is a very simple lesson, which is that in the pandemic, we've learned that despite all the globalist propaganda, if you want to be safe, you know, you're going to be much safer in the nation because the nation will look after you. The EU is not going to watch you back. The IMF is not going to watch you back. The World Health Organization is going to watch you back. So first of all, it's the nation. Secondly, it's your community, you know, where you live. 
that is going to be backing you up and finally your family you know, you know if you'll be really safe whether you're in hungary poland or england you're going to be relying on these institutions these traditional resources not on some abstract international institution and i think we have to use these experiences like the pandemic to promote the kind of arguments that we think are, are really quite important aggressively and not reactively and i think uh, what we need are more uh, intellectuals we need more artists we need more, more people in the media who can play these roles because that's the area where we're very weak at we have very few conservative filmmakers very few conservative rock stars very few conservative celebrities and you know, all the rest of them and that that kind of popular culture is an important resource and we've got to think of finding ways and means of inspiring the young the young to make our values look cool rather than the way it looks at the moment as being tired boring you know sort of oh who wants to be you know who wants to listen to that kind of stuff and i because i think that what we're discussing here amongst ourselves is actually quite exciting right it, it can be turned into into a real buzzy kind of set of ideas and that's what we got to aspire to and not just rely on east europe to do this but here in england you know we got to use the resources that were left behind by brexit that wonderful moment of you know, feeling that we're, we're we're a nation harness it to uh, to some kind of positive project well frank i mean thank you it's a great way to leave and i have to say that uh you know when you talk about orban i mean you know those celebrities and those media people you mentioned they have done such a demonizing job, as you must know. I mean, he's virtually, you know, beyond the pale completely, uh, which I think proves our point, actually, um, from that point of view. Thank you very much for joining us, Frank. Thank you very much indeed, James. Thank you, Anishka. Thank you, too, Emma. Uh, that's all for uh, Counterculture this week. So um, please do subscribe, won't you? Uh, we need you to subscribe. It's totally free. Anyway, uh, we shall see you next time. Thank you.